Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, you can use all the oxygen. Get in here. <laughs> um, just a really quick a show of hands. I mean, we're going to be talking about GPU ray tracing. Um, not just what we're doing, but what other people are doing, general capabilities, general things to think about, um, things to think about in the future and the like. Uh, right here, how many people here have actually done any GPU ray tracing development? Great. Okay. How many are thinking about doing it? All right. And how many just like to use it? Okay. And how many didn't raise your hand? <laughs> OK, not too many. We've got a few curious. That's not too bad. OK, so we've got everyone here interested in GPU ray tracing. Uh, some people have been doing it. Um, we know your pain. Um, those of you willing to do it, wanting to do it, we're, we're hoping to make your world a little easier. Um, OK, so my name's Phil Miller. I'm, uh, I uh, direct product management for uh, all the rendering software that we're doing in uh, Professional Solutions Group at NVIDIA. And this is David McAllister, who manages the development team for Optics, um, and we're, which is really where our, uh, a lot of our leading edge goes for enabling other developers. Um, also, we have people in the audience from uh, the Mental Ray and iRay teams here as well. So people actually in the trenches uh, creating uh, commercial uh, solutions uh, that you know, meet the rigors of you know, commercial needs as well. So really quickly, I mean, my, my talk is going to be somewhat short, more, more high level um, in, in regards to you know, some, of these, some of these areas. And I'm going to pass over to David, and he's going to go into a lot more depth uh, to the, to the uh, nuts and bolts. So just giving you a little idea of where we're going and, uh, and the like. Um, we're hoping to do some demos. We've been having some demo challenges. We're not quite sure if we're going to get there or not. Is this one live? OK. One thing I thought would be interesting to do is just take a look back at where GPU ray tracing has come in the last few years. I mean, four C graphs ago, and we all judge our lives by C graphs, right? You count you C graphs, not in years. Um, then about four C graphs ago, the gauntlet was thrown down and said, you know, the future of graphics is ray tracing, and the GPU can't do it. You guys are out of luck. Well, we took that challenge at, um, uh, pretty strongly, and uh, then one C graph later, um, we showed that we could do it. We showed a 30 frame a second, uh, you know, city scene, really basic direct illuminate. I mean, direct uh, primary ray uh, 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 rendering, but it was on real hardware rendering a real scene. And everyone said, "Great, you can do it. We can't." <laughs> so you've 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 done a good stunt. So then, one CGraph later, we said, "Okay, we debuted optics." Well, first of all, what we did is we 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 published papers on how we did it. Um, and then what we found is nobody really wanted the renderer that we created. After all, it was just a demo. People wanted to just get that type of speed into their renderers. And that's what inspired us to create optics, is to make people make it a lot easier for people to uh, add GPU acceleration to their renderers, not, not to adopt our renderer. So suddenly, with that C graph, suddenly everybody could get access to it. Also, we had told everybody the techniques we were using, and they could even roll their own. So a lot of different techniques, a lot of different things were happening two C-graphs ago. Then the last C-graph, there were a lot of companies doing it. There were about eight companies on the show floor uh, debuting, showing, uh, sneak peeking, different types of GPU ray tracing. Now, at this C-graph, it's pretty mainstream. Uh, people are no longer thinking about if you can do it. It's more like, when's the next version? Can I get the next release? Can I get the next you know, capability? How can I get eight GPUs into a box? How can, I, um, how can I get more memory onto a card? And that was one of the things that we've been concentrating on was that. And that's what I mean when I say here, now you can do almost anything. Um, we've been breaking down the barriers on memory as well as other companies, as well, uh, too, have also been doing it. And finally, next year, we believe that you'll be able to do ray tracing anywhere. This means that we'll be showing uh, real commercial cloud applications. In fact, there's already one in action right now doing iRay in the cloud. And we think this is going to become more mainstream. So the power of GPU ray tracing will get to everybody, regardless of the size of your device. 
So the other thing I'd like to kind of set to rest, I get, I get to answer these questions you know, all the time. <laughs> and one of my favorite is you know, that the only thing you can do on a GPU is path tracing. I'm not sure how this rumor got started, but it's absolutely incorrect. Um, you can do anything you want. It's, it's simply C, after all. And it's, you're limited only by your own ability to program. It's true there are a lot of path tracers using the GPU right now, but that's not because the GPU can only do that. It's because the GPU finally made that technique feasible. <laughs> that technique's been around for so many years, but it's so slow. Well, getting a 10, 20 speed up on the GPU suddenly made that technique plausible. That's why you're seeing so many path tracers on the GPU. Finally, I should say next, you only can use the really expensive GPUs from NVIDIA. Well, that's not true. Um, all GPUs basically run the same when it comes to compute. So all the GPUs that NVIDIA manufactures basically are capable for you know, running uh, GPU ray tracing. Um, you know, GPU farm is a lot more expensive than CPU farm. Well, not if you're counting, perf uh, not if you're counting performance. So if you're counting how much, you know, how much fast those frames are going to render, uh, how much perf per dollar you're getting, uh, a GPU farm is way cheaper than a CPU farm. And a GPU isn't that much faster after all, or a, a car, you know, versus like a hex core or a, a really good Nehalem or something. Well, that's not true. Um, mileage varies according to who's writing the code, but on average, we're getting, we're seeing developers get between four to twelve x um, their CPU code. And then GPU ray tracing is hard. You're right, it is. <laughs> um, if you're doing it by yourself, it can be it can be really challenging. But that's also why we created Optics because we knew it was hard. And we wanted to really lower that barrier for people so that you could concentrate on making the renderer and not on doing all the GPU uh, low-level stuff. And finally, you're seeing this to fit into, true, into GPU memory. Well, that's true. Um, but that's also something that we've been, we, we've been tearing down. So that was really the last, that was the one question that we always got hit with that we kind of eked away from because we knew it was true. But you know, that's one of the reasons that uh, Dave's team has been working nonstop for what, since December? December. <laughs> since October 22nd, actually. <laughs> Optics week. OK. Um, since then, to uh, really uh, nail this one big issue. OK. Um, so really quickly, for those of you who you know, are looking at GPU ray tracing or thinking about it, um, I'd like to talk about some similarities that any Buddy doing GPU ray tracing is going to be facing, um, or if you're using it. So this will go. It doesn't really matter whose render you're using. It could be iRay, it could be Arian, it could be you know, it could be whatever you want to be using. But they're all going to have very similar uh, situations. First, speed. It's not that hard to figure out how fast it's going to go. Count the cores. Count the cores, and then also apply. Pay attention to the clock. Take those two together, and you've got a linear ramp according to your speed for a given GPU architecture. So it's not that hard to figure out uh, which, which GPUs are going to give you what yield and how fast they're going to go. When a new GPU comes out, you can tell immediately what it's going to do to your uh, ray tracing life. Now, this is only for every GPU architecture. So when we come out with a brand new one, so we're on Fermi right now, uh, when we come out with the next one, which is Kepler, there'll be a jump. So, um, so it's, it's nice and steady uh, on your core count and clock for a given GPU. And then there's a stair step when you get to the next one. Now, this varies according to your solution. So some are, get more optimized than others. Optics, because we're part of research uh, for a long time and have people concentrating on the GPU architectures, we get pretty good bumps. We got, a, we got a 2x bump going from GT200, sorry, from G80 to GT200. And we got a 4x bump going from uh, GT200 to Fermi. And what are our guesstimates on Kepler right now? Don't, don't hold us to this, but what? We don't have any estimates. You don't? No. Unless Martin's in the room. Ah, OK. Nope. Well, we think we'll, we'll, think we'll, do, we'll do pretty well again next time. Um, the next is that um, most GP, it's not that hard to, to have your application scale across GPUs in the system. Um, a little bit of sample code gets most programmers along the way to scale across GPUs. And it usually scales pretty well. Um, they will vary, though, sometimes because once you go across the bus, you do take a hit. So the first GPU might give you, say, 
uh, 10x. Maybe the second GPU might only give you 8x. You know, so it's only you're only getting 80% efficiency. Then you're paying that price to go across the bus. Um, but after that, you should give you a constant like 80%, 80%, 80%. Um, you hear about SLI often for doing massive or, or for doing large displays or gaming displays and everything like that. That has no relation to GPU computing. Forget about it. So you don't need SLI when it comes to um, when it comes to compute. Um, also, the scaling efficiency going across between GPUs is going to vary according to your application type, what, what your technique is. Um, the slower your technique, if you, if you have something that's very computational, you're going to scale really well. Path tracing, for example, scales very well because there, um, there's a lot to be computed. If you're doing something super simple, um, like witted style ray tracing or cook style ray tracing, you can actually barely get any benefit from the second GPU because it's so fast on the first GPU, right? We've had to have some of those challenges. Yes, that, that can be a problem. <laughs> it, it, it's mostly bottlenecked by, by the PCIe design. Right, and, right. You know, there, there's ways around that in future architectures, but that's where it is now. Right. And what Dave's talking about is that we, we find these bottlenecks and these things that are holding us back, and we, we go back to architecture and tell them so that they can start to break down those barriers so that we don't have, so that we can get that scaling as we add more GPUs. Um, double precision, that's an application choice. Most ray tracers don't need it. Um, ECC, error correction memory, um, that is a user choice. And again, usually you don't need it. Uh, both of those are big speed hits that most people don't, you know, decide to turn on. Um, one thing, if you're doing an interactive application, you have to be very careful about how you are treating the interactivity of the app. So all your mouse movements, all your menu commands, everything like that, you're fighting with the GPU while it's ray tracing. Now, you can solve this by putting in a second GPU <laughs> and slaving that one to the graphics. Um, we, on the show floor, we're doing that in several places. Um, or you can get very clever about how you write your application about when you're using what and, and uh, when you're turning on what uh, in, terms, in terms of graphics or ray tracing. So you, have to, you just have to spend more time thinking about this than you normally would in a general graphics application. I would say we probably have it's probably about 20% of our questions. Is on how to maintain interactivity. Yeah. Yep. Um, GTX GPUs, GeForce GPUs. These things are fast. They are the, they're designed for the ultimate gaming performance. No question about it. They are the fastest GPUs that NVIDIA makes. They are not designed for GPU compute 24-7 operation. We do not recommend putting these into a render farm. If we're, we think you will be disappointed. <laughs> Um, they're just not made the same way. They're, they, they're, they do not pay attention to heat the same way. They don't dissipate heat the same way. Um, there's a reason why the designs of our boards are very different from one another. Um, uh, the, the professional GPUs are designed to be actually running in data center situations, you know, 24-7. Uh, when you start putting those into, uh, when you put gaming machines uh, in, a, in a situation like that, they're not going to last too long. And so we're warning you. Be careful about that. Um, and then finally, of course, um, when we mean the entire scene has to fit into memory, we mean everything. We mean the geometry, the textures, the acceleration structures, whatever else is in your program that you need to figure that you need for your calculation. That all has to be in memory for it to work. Now, that has been a big barrier, and that's one of the reasons that you know we're, we're excited by the by uh, by breaking it down with uh, the upcoming optics release. Really quick, um, just a reminder of our GPU uh, uh, architecture in the sense that we have a basically the GPU as well as the, uh, uh, the CUDA uh, 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 architecture sits at the low level. And then on top of that sits our, sits our ability to support various languages. 
And we try to treat these as equal as possible. Um, of course, some are much more advanced than others. C++ and C have years upon uh, many of the other languages here. But as a developer, somebody who's deciding to go about doing a GPU ray tracer, you get to choose what language you want to use. Um, and it'll basically all work the same. I say this because as we come to this, this is a list of some of the, some of the more widely known uh, uh, ray tracing solutions out there right now. Now, these are the ray tracing solutions, not the applications. So some of these go into different applications, and this list gets longer. But these are just the renderers out there right now using GPU uh, ray tracing. And here's a you know, kind of selection around the different types of um, uh, languages they used. There's actually two types of C. There's the you know, C runtime as well as the C driver API. Um, and then, of course, we've got some uh, that are actually using OpenCL. Um, and then uh, some that are supporting out of core uh, or will be supporting out of core in the future. But coming from 4C graphs ago, when they said that you, know, you just can't do ray tracing on the GPU, this is a pretty impressive list to have. Um, <clears throat> OK, everyone says, well, how much faster than a GPU is, or how much faster than a CPU is it? Mileage always varies according to you know, how you are writing your code. But here are some things to think about when you're doing this. The hardest thing to do is to keep the GPU busy. It, it often, it's done, it's waiting for something else, and your job as a programmer is to keep that pipe full and just keep it you know, solid with instructions for it to, to work on. And this is the, the biggest challenge of uh, GPU ray tracing is to keep that, is to keep that uh, throat completely solid. And the more you can do that, the higher your efficiency is gonna get. You want to talk about any of these? You can do it better than me. Let's see. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's hard okay. to read from this angle. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. So, so the, this concept of, of keeping the GPU fed uh, applies in, to the first sub-bullet here, um, where the, the more complex the task, the more the GPU has to chew on, the better uh, it will scale, so, so the better speed up you'll get. Um, you'll, your, whatever serial bottlenecks you ha may have will be um, overshadowed. Um, and and you know, the, the same is even more true with multiple GPUs. You have to copy the data back and forth, uh, such as your final output buffer. It has to land on whatever GPU is doing scan out. So you've got these overheads of copying that image back and forth, and so the more work you're doing uh, per copy, the less that copy matters. And um, and, and, and like, like everything related to uh, data parallelism, everything related to CUDA, um, you, you need to rethink your problem to express it in terms of uh, data parallelness um, instead of the old serial for loop approach. Okay. Thanks, David. And one example of that um, it was Optics 2.1. When we came with Optics 2.0, which supported Fermi, um, really hadn't been optimized yet. And the team went and tuned it in 2.1 and got between a 30 and 80% speed up. Um, basically, you know, on, this, on the exact same hardware, just by routing the code better for what that GPU class was, uh, could handle. So, you know, we, we don't get it right the first time always, but the, the nice thing is that once we do it, you immediately benefit from it. Okay, so, you know, as, you know, at, you, you look at NVIDIA, we have all the languages, we have, we have engines, we have DLLs and everything, and also we have commercial products. It's like, what are, what are really your goals? Well, the goal, we're, we're greedy. We want to accelerate everything. We, want all, we, we believe that all rendering can be accelerated, and we'd like to help you do it. So really, our, our goal here is to help every renderer out there get a lot faster. Um, I mean, that, of course, helps us with hardware, but we, we have an inherent uh, belief that fast graphics is good. It, 
it spurs the creative uh, spirit, what's possible in design, in artistry, and once that barrier uh, keeps getting lifted, great things can occur. So that's what fuels us. That's what gets us going all the time at NVIDIA is you know, you know, really raising that bar. And so we'd like to, to help all of you do it as well. And you know, that's one of the reasons that we put all this work into the libraries and to, into, into things like uh, a framework like Optics is to make it easy for everybody to exploit the GPU. And in doing that, we learn how to make the GPU better for the future. Because in general, you know, uh, we believe that the future of, of graphics is advanced rendering, is compute-based graphics. And all of this becomes a loop of influencing one another. What we're creating, how you're receiving it, what the hardware can do, influence the hardware, come back again. That's also true on the commercial side. So as we are advancing our commercial offerings with things like Mental Ray and iRay, um, we need to keep those as good as possible so that we know the, what you are facing as commercial developers out there as well. You know, what it takes to make it interactive and pleasing to a customer. What it, may, what it means to be, you know, work on all the platforms and be reliable. Um, it's not good enough just to put out a library. You know, you need somebody who knows, who, who's out there with you uh, and doing the same level of commercial uh, rigor that you are yourselves. We then that plow that knowledge back into our system for improving the GPU, improving the languages, improving all the tools so that you, what we're learning gets fed back to you. So that's one of our primary reasons for doing you know, commercial software. It's the best way for us to learn. So, you know, in general, you know, if you're developing solutions, we want to help you. You know, we want to help you, you know, in your coding. We want to help you with libraries uh, and, and assistance or even in, in the adoption of any of our solutions, however you'd like. Okay. Now, we were going to be having a demo. It looks like we're not quite here. We want to, we want to switch, and I'll try to get that thing up. Um, yeah, if you can switch to it, you know, you'll have to, you'll have to, we can't get this display to work at all. Okay, I'll mess with the display. I'll, me I'll, I'll mess with the display. Um, really quick, switch back to my monitor. One exciting thing here at the show, though, is that um, that we you know we're really concentrating on mental ray just as much as we are on you know all of our other rendering solutions. And the one thing that people have been asking a long time is like, when is it going to get GPU accelerated? Well, we now we finally can say, now. <laughs> um, and on the show floor, at the very least, you'll be able to see, you know, um, basically ambient occlusion running super fast um, on, you know, uh, in a side-by-side -side comparison of, the, of basically the same code running on the CPU versus the GPU. And so this is the exact same mental rate code. If you take these images, XOR them, you know, basically you'd get black. Um, of, of real scenes, and the, the ratios we're getting here are about, you know, on a dual, on a dual quad core versus a single GPU, you know, you're, you're seeing that ratio, which is about 18x on a, single quad, on a single quad core. So that's pretty interesting. That, and then we just started this. And we know there's a lot of headroom left to grow into, especially for sequential frames. So we think that sequ subsequent frames, and I bet a lot of you do animation if you're using Metal Ray, um, the sequential frames should be much faster yet because of the acceleration uh, structure building. We can get more efficient uh, uh, in, in ways uh, on, the, on the GPU than, than on the CPU. So a lot of headroom there. This is the beginning of good things happening for Mental Ray uh, for taking advantage of the GPU. Uh, no time yet on when that's going to be available, but you know we're working on it, and you can see it uh, downstairs at the, what is it, BART at the end of each day? End of last half hour of each day. Okay, last half hour each day. BART Godboy, uh, here if you don't know him. Um, you know, one of the premier people you want to know if you are interested in Mental Ray. Okay, this one really is a lead into the demo. So why don't we segue? Over to your talk, David. Okay. And I'll okay. mess with the monitor. <laughs> the slides are completely... Okay, can you hit my... 
mic. Can you change so, the slides again? My slides are totally different than they were 10 minutes ago. <laughs> He codes that fast sometimes, too. <laughs> but I don't check it in. <laughs> so how many of you have uh, downloaded optics? Wow, a good number. And, and uh, how many of you have used OpenGL in the past? Super. How about Direct3D? Okay, I, I didn't notice what the, uh, how much overlap there was between those two, but it, lo it looks like uh, uh, um, the majority of you are developers, um, so you'll, you'll understand and appreciate what uh, Optics is uh, by analogy to OpenGL. So um, for those of you familiar with OpenGL or D3D but not familiar with uh, Optics, they, they serve... They, they have the same basic idea of virtualizing the, the GPU, exposing its, its features, its rendering features to uh, the application through a uh, well-understood API, um, and providing functionality for you that would be pretty darn hard to get by yourself, and particularly hard to get at performance. So those are the same goals that Optics has. And uh, they're also similar uh, in that they both start with the letter O, but, they, <laughs> but primarily they're similar in that, that they're, they're the, the two primary ways of uh, utilizing the GPU for uh, standard graphics techniques. Okay, there's, there's plenty of techniques you can implement yourself if you want to use existing techniques as building blocks. Um, you've got OpenGL and D3D for raster-based graphics, and you've got optics for uh, ray tracing-based graphics. That's, that's sort of how I see optics from the highest level. Um, so, so just like OpenGL makes your, your raster graphics uh, perform faster, it also makes it faster to implement. You don't have to go and implement the rasterizer <coughs> yourself. That's the other primary goal of optics. It, it gives you what the GPU can, can give you, and it makes your life easier in the process. That's huge. And by the way, optics is a blast to program in. I, I absolutely love it. Um, let's see. So that's, that's, why, that's what optics is at the highest level. And, and then we'll zoom in a little bit more later on. Now, here's why to do optics. Um, not just that it makes your life easier as a programmer. Um, thank you. OK. <laughs> OK. I just recently became a manager. PowerPoint was not my job before that. This is not my talk. <laughs> um, shift F5 right here. Yeah, shift F5. Shift F5. What, what the hell? I don't know what happened. There. OK, that's me. This is you? Yeah. OK, but that's not the right slide. Yeah, OK. Shift. OK, so, so optics is middleware. Uh, middleware is one of those boring terms in the computer industry. But, but when the middleware is over a, uh, a graphics processor or, or any uh, powerful processor, I think you get two main things out of middleware. So how many of you have heard what GPU, the, the features that are going to be in NVIDIA's GPU uh, that's coming out five years from now. Me neither. Um, you know, we don't know what we're building in five years, and so you know, I'm sure 
you as developers uh, don't know either. And that makes it pretty darn hard to write code that's going to last five years. And now, you know, if it's a game, fine, you ship it once and you move on with your life. But there's a lot of other codes that should have a shelf life much longer than five years. And that's really hard if the, the hardware architecture is changing out from under you. So targeting a, a fast-moving processor architecture, it's a moving target. And middleware solves that for you. You target optics, and optics is optics is optics. Uh, we add features, but the features that are already there will always work. And so your app will always work. When Kepler comes out, uh, you won't have to do anything to get the performance of Kepler because we will have guys who've been slaving away for a good long time mapping the existing optics. It, okay, that's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> mapping the uh, existing optics API to work optimally on Kepler. And let me give an example of, of why that matters. With um, Phil mentioned that going from GT200 to Fermi, we got a 4x speed up. 2x of that was for free. We just ran the code and we got 2x. And now there's developers out there who did exactly that, and they celebrated over their 2x, and they moved on with their life. The optics team got our 2x for free, but then we put tons of work and got another 2x by optimizing for the Fermi architecture. We don't want you to have to do that for the Kepler architecture, so the optics team will do that. We'll, we'll make a version of optics that, that's a drop-in DLL. You don't even have to recompile your app, and it will go, you know, much fa it will go faster on Kepler than the prior non-tuned for Kepler optics DLL will. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So the other, the other grand reason that that I believe that middleware is good if it's middleware over a processor is that there's a lot of heavy lifting that we do for you. Um, so some examples of of what Optics gives you in the heavy lifting department that that's code you just don't want to write yourself. So at the heart of, of uh, fast ray tracing is an acceleration data structure. The common ones today are bounding volume hierarchies and KD trees. And uh, we build those hierarchies for you. This guy built his hierarchy himself, it looks like. Um, so, so there's a lot of work that goes into building a, a good, uh, an optimal bounding volume hierarchy. And you get that for free with optics. Likewise, traversing through that hierarchy on a GPU is uh, where we put a ton of our optimization effort, and um, you get all of the, the results of those efforts for free. If you write your ray tracer in straight up CUDA, you uh, have to handle all the different CUDA devices yourself. If you write it in optics, the, the multiple GPUs you have in your system uh, all appear as one to, uh, to the optics developer. You don't have to worry about the GPUs that are in there. We can even, if you want, choose which GPUs uh, to use and uh, which not to. So, so that, that saves you some headache. Um, part, of, part of getting optimal performance on, on the GPU for ray tracing or for any uh, compute application is managing the, the divergence of your code and the reconvergence. And uh, the GPU hardware does that quite well. It lets you program CUDA in a single threaded model. You think about what does this thread need to do, not what do all my threads need to do. But um, at times that can mean that not all of the processors are uh, being used. And so to code optimally, you sometimes want to reorder your work and uh, to, to use those processors at times that they would otherwise be waiting. And so Optics has an architecture that, that handles all of that for you to recapture the coherence in your threads so that they can team up again and uh, start doing the same thing together. Another thing we do that, that Phil alluded to that's coming in Optics 2.5 is 
uh, massive data sets, uh, data sets larger than can fit in GPU memory. And this is a, uh, a, a difficult challenge. I only know of uh, two other uh, efforts at uh, handling out-of-core data sets with ray tracing. Uh, the first was Pantoray by uh, Weta and NVIDIA, and uh, the second was Centileo, um, which uses the, the uh, GeForce GTX 480 and, and renders a massive model with path tracing. Uh, and then, and, and that, those are both very specific renderers. They're not a general API like optics. So to, to do out of core data sets in a general way uh, is a big pain. And uh, so sometimes I feel like this donkey here. Um, but that's what we'll be rolling out in the next few weeks. And I'll give you more details on that and the pain here in a few slides. We're rolling out the beta, right? Yes, yeah, the first beta, <laughs> when you can get your hands on it, will be in a few weeks. Right. And then it'll be rock solid uh, not long after that. Um, another thing that, that Optics gives you uh, for free is um, the, the acceleration data structures have to be built, have to be rebuilt whenever the model changes. So if you're in a, a CAD app, and you, you know, drag a piece of your model or deform it in any other way, you have to rebuild that acceleration structure. And uh, you know, I've seen those take overnight to rebuild. Um, Kirill in our team just presented a paper um, on Saturday on his research for doing acceleration data set builds blindingly fast. Uh, and let me give you an example of how fast that is. Let's see. So what we're going to show here is a 400,000 polygon model where the acceleration data structure is being rebuilt about um, 10 times a second. Uh, but, but the actual time to do the rebuild is, what, six milliseconds? OK, so around six milliseconds to build an acceleration structure over 400,000 triangles. Uh, to do that on the CPU with an equivalent quality builder has been around between 5 and 15 seconds. So we're modifying the, the geometry here every frame and, uh, and then rebuilding the acceleration structure. So th we're pretty excited about this. Th this fast acceleration structure build will be very useful if you're editing in your CAD app. It'll be useful if you've got fish swimming around your scene. It'll be useful for um, any for any time your scene changes due to gameplay or, or any other reason. So that, that's one thing we're quite excited about. And the last of, of the heavy lifting uh, things that, that Optics does for you is th there's a, a, a very few fixed resources on the GPU. M most have been generalized. Uh, we referred to, to uh, the GPU memory and how we're generalizing that. Another uh, one is the number of textures. So, so since rays can hit anywhere in the world, unlike uh, the model you're rasterizing right now in OpenGL, you have to have all the textures in the whole world resident on the GPU and bound. And only 128 textures can be bound even on our, our current uh, Fermi class cards. So if you've got a whole ton of, of different textures, that's been a bottleneck. So we've gotten around that bottleneck in a really smart way where we, we look at, at the textures that are, are best rendered using the GPU's texture hardware, and we bind those to the texture hardware. And the other ones, some of which are, in fact, uh, more efficient to software render, to, to change the, the text load instruction into just a memory load instruction. For the textures like that, we, we 
actually go and modify the code that you hand us, and we rewrite your text instructions to be load instructions. And uh, it, you're, sometimes you get a speed up from that, um, but, but the main point is that it lets you handle any number of textures in your world. It, it's uh, a bottleneck that we've gotten past. How am I on time? Well, while keeping it fast. Yeah. Yes, sometimes faster, and uh, we've never seen okay. anything where it's less than like 5% slower. You've got like 10 or 15 left. OK. Um, yeah, the, one of the things is that most, uh, most ray tracers out there uh, that are using the GPU, uh, they just use their global memory all the time. And it's an easier way to program. You don't have to worry about what, what David was just talking about. But you're leaving performance on the table. Because the texture units on the GPU are actually pretty good to use if you can use them. Um, but there are only 120, 128 of them. Mm -hmm. So we're basically doing all that file management for you. <laughs> and so and we're letting the other ones spill into global. But we keep those first 128 nice and fast. Yep. So, so I've found that most other uh, GPU-based ray tracers don't use the texture hardware at all. No, they don't. So because yeah. of this bottleneck. And we made the trade-off differently for our first two versions and decided, get the perf, have the bottleneck. And now we're keeping the, keeping the perf, or at least 95% of it, and getting rid of the bottleneck. Right. So let's look for, for just a minute at, at what optics looks like. Um, what, what, if you were to program optics, how would you think? So we'll start by looking at ray tracing. Um, you have a ray coming out of your uh, eye or your camera. And so in optics, you express this ray with a ray generation program. And the most typical one would be a pinhole camera model that, that just computes the ray through the center of projection, through the pixel, and makes the ray and, and then traces it. It can be anything else. Um, I've, seen, I've seen ray generation programs with an entire renderer in them. This is, this is very general code. Um, <coughs> so your ray generation program is, lets you express a pinhole camera, a cylindrical camera, a spherical camera, um, anything you want. So you've got your ray now. And the next thing you need to express to optics is what this ray might intersect against. Okay, so you're expressing your geometry, and uh, most typically we use triangles. Uh, so your intersection program will be a ray triangle intersection program, just like you wrote in your graphics class in college. Um, but you can, but you hand that program to optics. So, so the buffers with your data plus the intersection program define your geometry. And it can be anything you want. It's fully programmable. It can be spheres. It can be height fields. Uh, it can be, oh, what's the weirdest one I've seen? Um, it, yep, it, it can be uh, cylindrical Bezier curves. Um, you, you hand it whatever code you want that will intersect array against the triangle. So here we've got spheres. And then third, the question is, what happens when the ray hits something? So um, you get to express what, what properties do I care about? The, the texture coordinates at the hit point, the normal. Uh, what do I not care about? Which is very important for getting perf. If, if you don't care about the text chords, don't compute them. Um, or if you compute them but don't use them, they'll get optimized out. Um, so you've computed what you care about in your intersection program, and then you, you uh, shade uh, the hit point with basic shader code like you've, you've written many times. Uh, it, you know, Fong, um, you know, Fresnel, wh whatever you care about, you can implement that. And we've got two programmable entry points for that. One for uh, this is the closest hit. The, the closest thing that the ray hit, um, that's generally your, your, what you would think of as your material shader. And then there's another uh, any hit program that you can run for things like uh, shadows. So once it hits something, I know I can stop. Um, or for attenuating um, color as, as you pass through layers of transparent glass or so on, you, you would... Uh, 
your AnyHead program would be called multiple times and it would do the attenuation just how you want. So um, data, I data in buffers that, that's bound to your vertices or your geometry plus these closest hit and any hit programs express the, the material model in CUDA. And uh, the, the data that, that comes along with your ray, you know, it can be an attenuation value, it can be um, a full color, it, any, anything you care about, uh, about the answer of what this ray hits. You, des you decide what the answer is and you define that data structure and then we carry it along for you. Okay, and here's an example of what this looks like from a code level. Here's the pinhole camera model that we referred to and the ray sphere intersection code and the, the uh, Lambertian shading closest hit program. Um, these are, this is C++. You, uh, you've known it since you were a child. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's very general. You, you can have templates in here and, and you know, they're, they're compiled with NVCC and, and uh, so it, it's very fast general code that you're, you're very familiar with. We didn't make our own shading language. And I am going to skip this because I haven't read this slide in a year. Um, so, so in, in terms that, that the subset of you that know OpenGL and Direct3D are familiar with, here's a quick mapping from the programmable entry points of OpenGL and D3D to the programmable entry points in optics. So fragment programs are the shaders, that's like our closest hit and any hit programs. Vertex programs are roughly analogous to our intersection programs. Geometry programs that run over whole um, primitives are like our selector program that basically lets you do all sorts of hand wavy cool tricks. And then um, we have three more ray generation programs that the programmable camera, the MIS program, and the exception program, what to do when you have a stack overflow or something. Um, okay, now, now three quick things that we've added in Optics 2.5 and then I'm done. Um, let's see, so, so Phil suggested that for those of you who are already familiar with optics, uh, that, that I kind of teach you about our acceleration data structure uh, builders. So uh, we can build KD trees and we can build BVHs, uh, bounding volume hierarchies. And, and there's, there's several different kinds of builders and they're on a spectrum from uh, fast to ray trace with to fast to build. So the fastest to ray trace with uh, this one was from a paper by one of our guys, Martin Steech, um, the SBVH that, that handles irregular geometry. Um, and it's built on the CPU, then the standard BVH that the algorithm has been around for 10 years. Uh, we build that on the CPU and that's very general and very high quality. Uh, and it works on things that are not triangles. Uh, SBVH requires triangles. Median BVH is kind of in the middle. It's also uh, implemented on the CPU. It, um, it's the fastest one to build on the CPU. So if you don't want to spend any GPU time building, then median BVH is your friend. Um, and then LBVH, the, the linearized BVH is built on the GPU. And, uh, if you're familiar with Optics 1 or Optics 2, we, we have a builder called LBVH, and we've used that same name to put in the new algorithm that uh, Kirill's paper was about that's much faster. And uh, so in Optics 2.5, LBVH will mean this blindingly fast build that's done on the GPU that can be used for animation like that hairball or for uh, real-time editing. And so LBVH gives this kind of performance um, researchers in this area are familiar with the, the fairy forest model. It's only 174,000 triangles, but it can be built in 4.8 milliseconds. Um, so if that much of your, your game scene is changing per frame, this uh, could be suitable for you. The turbine blade, another standard model, 2 million polygons, 
build the BVH in 10 milliseconds. And then the power plant model here that's been used as a massive model for 15 years to the point where it's not so massive anymore, um, far from it, uh, we can build the BVH on the power plant in 62 milliseconds. So the other big thing, uh, the paging that we've been talking about, um, we've got two use cases in mind for it. If you, if you are doing a 100 gigabyte film frame, um, it'll still be painful to do this. It, it won't crash, but that's not our design point. A 100 gigabyte data set on a 6 gigabyte card should work, but it's not our design point. Uh, our design points are twofold. Um, the, the one on the, la on the left is um, your standard app that's been out there for a while um, that's not a massive data set app. You don't want it to crash when your user chooses to load a 513 megabyte data set on their 512 megabyte laptop GPU. So um, we handle that case. And the other case we handle is when you're when you have a big data set that fits in core memory, so 24 gigabytes, something like that, and you've got a, a 6 gigabyte um, quadro card, where you're about 3x oversubscribed the GPU memory, we target that case. And for that, uh, you'll want your app to know about that um, so that you can handle your, your data right. Um, and, and you should get a very little slowdown in the first case and a slowdown in the, in the big data set case, um, but not, it won't crash, it, it will work, and, and we, we've targeted the case where about 3x the size. Um, I'm gonna skip how we did paging. Trust me, it was a lot of effort, and it's, it's enabled by the fact that the core of optics is a compiler. We take those programs that you write in C++ and hand us, and we stitch them all together. We compile them and make a, a mega kernel, we call it, and where we've massaged your data to do the right thing. And now we further massage it to replace load, load and store instructions with a virtual memory system that we've written in software. These guys probably want to know, yeah. will they need to recode anything to take advantage of it? OK, for you don't have to. It'll still work. And uh, your, your perf should be reasonable if, if your data set size is about what it used to be, just a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, but the recoding that you can do, we've got utility functions to just reorder your triangles in the way that's most friendly to paging. If your triangles are spatially localized, um, chances are that several rays want to hit them at about the same time. So if you put them local to each other in memory, then we can copy them all down to GP, the GPU at once. And so we provide code, uh, some behind your back when it's not harmful, some as utility functions for you if, if your app would care about that so that you can get maximum data locality and therefore maximum perf. Um, so what I've just told you about is Optics 2.5. And it's, it's you know a beta very soon. And Optics 3.5, Oh, coming early next year, it, it will be our one that's optimized for Kepler. And its other big feature is that uh, it will run on a CPU. You don't even have to have an NVIDIA GPU in the machine. If you've got a competitor GPU or no GPU at all, it will still work. It will work for you know, baking on your server farm. Um, your server farm ought to have quadros in it. But just in case it's an antique server farm, uh, with, quadru with Optics 3.0, it will work because we can target the CPU as well. And uh, that's all I've got. Okay, we'll get the one um, perf chart um, yeah. in the other deck. Great. We can kind of close on that. I'm not going back to that target, though. No. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so these are some preliminary tests. That should say pr preliminary, not primary tests. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, so we did, basically we were comparing a six gigabyte card with a, um, a two and a half gigabyte card. A quad, God, can you tell I was tired? Okay. <laughs> Close enough. Oh, you okay. Got it. okay. Okay. 
All right, and so what you're looking at here, these aren't stacked volumes. Basically, this is um, the Quadro 6000 and behind, and then the Quadro 5000 be before it. And what you hit is you hit a cliff. So the, the cards are going at about close to the same speed because they have similar core counts. And then all of a sudden, the one runs out of memory, and it just hits a cliff. But it then is a constant after that point. Um, that's what's happening with geometry. So here we just loaded huge amounts of geometry, and then just we tried to take textures out of the equation, and so we just did ambient occlusion on them. Um, and so here you're seeing a big cliff. This is actually a natural slope down the out of core for the for um, the six gigabyte six thousand is over here at about 50, 50 million triangles, but over here at about twenty two twenty three million triangles, the, the smaller board ran out and then it just drops. But it still is substantially faster than what a quad core would be doing at the same time. And then on textures, here we're using, this is a number of 4K images. So 100, 200 uh, 4K images. Now about 190 of them will saturate a six gig card. Um, so if you're using, you know, these were individual, basically we, we did 200 frames off of a red camera. And we're using that as our texture, texture base. Um, and we have more of a glide path. It's not as much of a cliff um, when we're re dealing with textures. And that has something to do with the way we deal with texture memory. Um, but these are some of the preliminary things. Uh, we already, you already said it got faster. Yep. <laughs> um, and some of the things that you know, we look forward to working with you on as this comes to beta really soon.